like yeah. Sean. Well, you know, I, I, I was sitting here with my with my mirrorless Sony <laughs> camera, Alpha. I hadn't used it in a long time. And then I was doing actually interviews, fellowship interviews. And I saw someone who, an applicant, and I was like, wow, you're... Your video is is so good, and I'm like, how does it? How she basically said, listen, my, I think her her fiance has a you know, interest in this. And he set it up, and I'm like, HDMI capture card, set it up, and you're and you're good to go. I was like, wow, okay. It, that wasn't Lawrence Kuska, was it? He's got an amazing setup. I I yeah. I, he's also. I've been chatting to him, and I'm yeah. impressed. People have like a whole mixing studio in their in their office. So I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, getting there. I'm kind of envious of that, you know. So just want to welcome um, everybody to uh, another version of Prism Eye Rounds Wednesday evening here in Toronto. Uh, please tell us where you're coming from. It's always nice to see uh, the chat kind of light up a bit, and people can tell us where they are where they are calling. It's amazing, you know. We we have seen uh, people from all over the world um, attending. So our first ones from Richmond, all right, San Fran, Lima, Nigeria. Chris, they came from Nigeria to see you, buddy. That's pretty amazing. Oh, I oh, love Jason Jones. Big oh, fan Jason of Jason Jones. Jones. He's going to keep us. He's going to keep us honest. Okay, he's going to keep us honest. Jason, <laughs> this, you're going to enjoy these cases, Jason. We're going to hear from. We want to hear from you piping up in the chat group, uh, as well. Um, so Duke ROC. is here. Garth is a regular. Yeah. Ravi has arrived. Okay, now now that Ravi Gold is here, we all know Ravi um, uh, is here. He's a regular here, an academy academy guy. Uh, very active on social media. Alan Carlson, good to see Alan here. Alan, I wish your family well. I know that I think your uh, it was your mother-in-law that was ill, and I hope she's feeling better. And you're, I know you're taking good care of your family. Good to see you. Um, Emma's here from Chicago. Good to see Emma here. So a lot of people here in New York City. Excellent. Um, so as you all know, we we uh, we do vary our topics, and we're so thrilled to have a collaboration with Yale and the team from Yale and. I'll get Matthew Brink to do the introductions. Um, I think it's going to be, I'm really looking forward to this because uh, I'm sure it's going to be quite interactive and probably some controversy as well. And definitely light up the chat board, disagree with us, agree, give us some new ideas. I can tell you that I, I have, I mean, Matthew, Matthew, you know this, we've actually come up and modified our techniques and even label some of our techniques. I'm going to publish some of these things based on suggestions from you all here. I kind of wish I remember who it was so we can make them a co-author some of these some of these things that we're learning here on, 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 uh, on Zoom. Uh, a a Aiden Lee saying from New Haven, go Yale. You got Aiden saying, go Yale. You got some Yale, Yale people here for you. So Matthew, if you want to share, share your screen, we'll, um, we'll get started and uh, looking forward to thank you everybody for joining us here today. Thanks, Ike. All right, so we've got a special bunch over here. Um, a lot of the people here joining us today have some connection to me, which is cool. Um, I'm going to do some brief introductions. Um, we have a packed agenda, so it's not going to be a long introduction um, to each. So um, here it is, though. Thanks to the Yale team. You guys are awesome. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Tang, thank you for being here. Um, he's the program director at Yale and doesn't really need that much of an introduction. But, um, you know, glaucoma extraordinaire, director of the fellowship there, um, went to SUNY Downstate College of Medicine, residency at um, New York uh, University Medical Center, and then uh, Glaucoma Fellowship at New York Eye and Ear Inf uh, Infirmary. You know, it's always awesome learning from Dr. Tang, and, and you'll see. Just just wait for it. You, you're going to love it. Um, Dr. Liu, also at Yale. I mean, that's um, everybody here, but uh, he's an assistant professor there, um, doctor of medicine from Hunan Medical School, postdoctoral fellow, and then research associate at Shea Eye Institute at Penn, and then residency at um, GW and Glaucoma Fellowship at Yale. Ian um, went to residency with me, he was my chief, so you know, I've got a special place for Ian. Uh, currently working at Charlotte Eye, Ear, uh, Nose and Throat and um, crushing it over there. Um, Doctor of Medicine School of Medicine at La Jolla, um, uh, University of Chicago, um, and then residency with me, Sinai um, Hospital of Baltimore. Um, fellowship at Yale, and then Soshin. Um, that was two years ago, right Ian? Or three now. I, it's it's yeah like yeah exactly. <laughs> and then uh, the year after the this year after him was Soshin so um now an assistant professor at Yale so great congrats um doctor of medicine from Tufts ophthalmology residency New York University and then fellowship at Yale Eileen went to medical school with me small world so current glaucoma fellow at Yale 
Um, so hang in there, Eileen. I know it's like being a fellow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we went to Drexel together. She did her residency at NASA University Medical Center. So thanks for being with us, guys. Um, I just wanted to keep that brief because I know you've got a ton of stuff and we're really looking forward to it. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Tang now. We got. We also got to introduce our, our honorary PRISM uh, Ricky's faculty. becoming a piece of furniture here. She's well known to everybody at this point, but thank you so much, Ricky, uh, for helping us um, put this together and, and brainstorm and have the idea in the first place. We really appreciate you. And Ricky, as you know, is uh, going for um, glaucoma fellowship next year at Indiana. So it's going to be awesome. Fantastic. Um, and Ricky, you, you have a Instagram, new Instagram account that you want to share, right? It's called Master the Pressure. Is that what it's called? Yeah, that's true. Um, and of course, Rahul Finney and um, Sachin deserve a, a shout out for that as well. I've got some, some buddies, some mutual friends of mine and Matt that, that are uh, partners with, with me in, in uh, Prime there. We'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I, I'm going to hand it over to Chris. I, I was just mentioning to Chris earlier that uh, I've known Chris for some time and he's, uh, he's a stellar guy, uh, skilled surgeon, smart guy, honest um you know he's got an, he's, he's an authority man and i, I love i love uh, being able to hang with him it's been some time um and uh you know high quality man i got nothing great nothing but great things to say about you chris thanks for joining us and i'll hand it over to you and the team and and you'll be uh you'll be hearing from us uh during the discussions thanks so much ike it's such an honor to be here don't make me cry so soon here <laughs> <laughs> A few disclosures, past consultant to a few companies, no current affiliations, but I got a handle on YouTube, um, Glaucoma Vid. So, uh, you know, if you want to see some videos, you know, you can check it out there. So a few weeks ago, you know, I'm hanging out here in New Haven and Ricky Enzor and Matt Brink, you know, sent us a ping and they were talking about, you know, who should they should invite for Prism Eye Rounds. And they're like, how about Tang? So they bring it up to their boss and he goes, Natasha Dang? Yes, <laughs> great idea. She is absolutely excellent. And meanwhile, Tang is sitting here saying, oh my gosh, is this really happening? <laughs> and this is the first thought that came to my mind. We're not worthy, we're not worthy. <laughs> Wayne's World, Mike Myers. Hey, Matt Brink, where's Mike Myers from? Mike Myers is from Canada. That's right. And then I was like, okay, settle down now. This is the probably one of the best phrases ever invented. Keep calm and carry on. Okay, get it together. We got to step up here. So I'm like, what can I offer to, you know, such an amazing session? I started, you know, in March. I've been such a big fan of all these rounds. And one of the great things about Yale is this secret society called Skull and Bones. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, that's something I could – you know, play off up here. And this is the um, tomb, the crypt on the Yale campus where all the big wigs who are part of the Skull and Bones Society, you know, enter and they get tapped, just like I got tapped to do this tonight. So I thought, all right, let's do Tales from the Crypt, which is this amazing show when Ike and I were younger, um, where they told, you know, stories. And I said, okay, let's do Prism Eye Rounds, Tales from the Crypt of the Skulls at Yale. And this was the introduction. <laughs> Looks like a, gl a glaucoma clinic here. That's right. Occasional horrors. So this, as you guys all know, is the Crypt Keeper. Well, the Crypt Keeper tonight <laughs> is Ike Ahmed. And Ike, man, this picture is just so tremendous. It looks straight out of central casting. I think they need to sign you up for Degrassi now. <laughs> and haircut. Thank you so much, Ike. It's a real honor to be here along with the Yale Glaucoma team. Before we begin, I just wanted to say a few words about Alan Crandall, who passed away in October of 2020. Alan Crandall was an amazing 
doctor, physician, surgeon, humanitarian, educator. And as we all know, he was Ike's mentor. Alan Crandall won the three humanitarian awards, three humanitarian awards from the largest organizations in US ophthalmology, AAO, Ascaris, and AGS. And the Ascaris Award was recently renamed the Chang Crandall Humanitarian Award. I first met Alan Crandall in 2009 at a cataract course. And after the talk, I went up to him and he taught me how to go do a um, sublux Marfan's cataract case. And I was just like, wow, this is just so amazing. In 2017, I had the honor of hosting Alan at Yale for the Bruce Shields lectureship. And he showed so many amazing videos and, you know, had just come back from South Sudan and told us so many amazing stories. And if you look at the picture here, this is our fellow Ann Shu, and she's wearing a large jacket. Well, that was Alan who gave her his jacket when she was cold. And that's just the type of guy that he was. In 2012, Alan gave the AGS Surgery Day lecture in New York, and I was sitting in the audience and I thought, wow, just amazing. Alan said, the glaucoma surgeon needs to be the best surgeon in the room. And I, I, you know, it just got me. And I had the honor of doing the AGS historian interview that year. And I took this picture. And I think this picture sums it up just mentor and mentee, amazing doctors and surgeons. And this is a picture from Ike in Utah. And Ike, I really, I would pay admission to watch you guys operate in those days. Somewhere, Alan's probably doing a humanitarian mission now, treating patients somewhere in the universe. Thank you so much, Alan. You will be missed. So beautiful, Chris, man. That's so, so touching, brother. Uh, and those those pictures brought back so many memories. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, you fit that mold, buddy. You fit that you fit that mold that Alan had really taught us about uh, approaching humanity, approaching surgery, and most of all, you know, just you know, trying to be the best person you can be, man. Thanks so much for that tribute. That's super kind, man. Right to the heart, man. Thank you. So kind to you. So I'll hand it over. I'll hand it over to the team for uh, for some good cases, in Alan's honor. That's great. And my daughter, of course, bombing me here. Okay, G. All right. Testosterone this way. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ike, Matt, and Ricky for having us here at the prison I run. I have watched so many Ike's amazing surgical videos over the years. Actually, Ike's YouTube channel is always my favorite to watch when I run a treadmill. I'm so honored to join the prison I run tonight. I'll start with a common clinical scenario we could see during an ED consult. This is a 66-year-old gentleman who came to ED due to acute onset of decreased vision, pain, and photophobia in the left eye. His left eye intraocular pressure was markedly elevated. On this slim photo of the left eye, we can see a hyperemic conscient hava, edematous cornea, a shallow anterior chamber, a fixed amygdalate pupil, and a significant cataract. On the anterior surface of his cataract lens, we can appreciate some gray whitish anterior lens opacities that are typical appearance of a glaucoma flecken. No iris neurovascularization was identified. 
Von Herrick view suggests a very narrow angle in the left eye. The gonioscopic exam revealed a critical narrow angle in the right eye, but no view in the left eye due to, a, due to the cornea edema. non the found the exam showed a normal optic nerve with a 0.3 cup to disc ratio in the right eye, but no view in the left. Here, I've listed the most likely differentials, but I think most of us would agree that this is a typical acute angle closure patient straight out of textbook. Now I'd like to pull our panelists and audience. What would you do next? I think we should chat in the uh, chat about what we should do. I don't think we have a poll set up for this one. Okay. Unless, uh, is that quick to do, Ike? Um, yeah, probably we won't be able to do it now, but it looks like people are, people are voting on the chat. That's probably a good idea. We can do the chat for, for yeah. now. I was just going to say that I, I, I got burned once when we had an acute angle closure and we couldn't get a view of the fundus. Um, and, you know, we proceeded with the, we'll see what people do. And it, it turned out to be a pretty significant uh, posture segment coronal melanoma that was kind of underlying. And so that's always taught me if I, if I can't get a view back there, if I have the luxury of having a B scan, uh, just, you know, grab a B scan and, and, and take a look sometime, you know, it's rare, but you may find something that uh, may alter, of course, your, your plan a bit. This sounds like it's pretty symmetric though, right? Uh, pretty symmetrical angles and similar anatomy. So. Right. Right. And B scan was down. Uh, retina was flat. So it looks like you got a lot of B's, a lot of B's. Hey, Matt, is that what we're looking at here? I, I, I feel that way. It's like, while you're at it, you might as well start with that. Okay. Yeah. So patient actually received a run of eye drops and oral acetazolamide and, uh, the decision was made actually to go ahead to do the organ laser um, peripheral iridoplasty of the left eye. His pressure improved very quickly after the iridoplasty. In 30 minutes, the pressure was down to 20, and within an hour, the pressure improved to 18. At this time, the patient was started on pilocopian temolo pred and asked for the follow up in one day. On the next day, his left vision improved to 2060, intraocular pressure remained normal. On this CLAM photo, in addition to glo uh, glocoflecon we've seen before, the cornea was much clearer. We also see the iridoplasty laser burns. Gonio showed areas of visible scleral spur in the left eye and the iridotomy was performed. The patient eventually had a cataract surgery left eye. Now I hand over the aerodoplastic treatment to Chris for more discussion. Thank you. That's really interesting. I, I'd love to hear um, more discussion on this. I don't know, maybe Chris, you're going to speak about this. But I, I have a feeling that the majority of folks out there would not have gone to an aerodoplasty as a, as a, as a first-line treatment. So I, I see you're going to speak about this. And I'm going to say a lot of people would have, would have just really pushed hard to go for that LPI from, from, the, from the outset. Um, which I know is, is often a classical answer in a, in, a, in a board exam, for example, meds and LPI. But uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I titled this talk, Situational Glaucoma, Ace Up Your Sleeve and Argon Laser Peripheral Iridoplasty. And, you know, I love sports so much and I'm inspired by athletes. And by the way, Natasha Deng is a huge Patriots fan. fan. She put it on her PRISM uh, bio, and she's one of the doctors at PRISM. And situational football is such an important thing, uh, situational um, football. And Bill Belichick, who's the greatest coach of all time in the NFL, you know, talks a lot about it, that Anything that comes up, you just have to be ready for. You don't know if it's going to come up this year, next year, or ever. You just got to be ready for whatever walks in through the door. So that's kind of one of the mantras that I teach our residents and fellows. So situational ophthalmology and situational glaucoma is really important, uh, just for the same reasons that I discussed. You just need to be ready at all times. I take so many of my applications in ophthalmology from sports situations. Steve Nash and Steph Curry are two of the greatest basketball players of all time. And they are two-time MVP award winners. 
And by the way, Matt Brink, where's Steve Nash from? South Africa and Canada, just like me. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, these guys are masters, right? And they're not physically opposing people. So how are they so good? Well, it's because they understand the mindset. It's what I talks about all the time. It's the mindset. It's about thinking, reading, reacting, and about understanding various situations. And that's how they develop their advantage. We need to apply that to surgery and ophthalmology, which many, many people do. Ace up your sleeve is a poker term, and it's got something that, you know, you can pull out and that's going to give you an advantage. So what is Alpi? It's a simple and effective means of opening up an appositionally closed angle and can be used when LPI cannot be performed or does not eliminate appositional angle closure or when there's mechanisms other than pupillary block present. How is it performed? You use an argon laser Abraham lens. You use long duration burn 0.5 to 0.7 seconds, low power 200 to 300 milliwatts and a large spot size of 500 microns and you put in 10 to 24 spots in the iris periphery. Krasnov, Kimbro, and Bob Rich, my mentor, developed the conceptual basis for the modern LP procedure. These are the various indications, acute angle closure, chronic angle closure, plateau iris syndrome, phacomorphic, nanophthalmos, et cetera. And those are the contraindications there. So this is a UBM of before and after ALPI. We can see that before there's appositional closure. There's a little bit of plateau iris there. We can see the plateau configuration. And after you do it, there's an open area of angle and you're putting in 20 to 24 spots in a situation like plateau iris. In acute angle closure glaucoma, LPI is certainly the definitive treatment to, this, to uh, eliminate any component of pupillary block. But many times, in angle closure, the LPI can't be achieved due to corneal edema, swollen iris, patient discomfort, shallow anterior chamber, or inflammation. This is a study out of Dennis Lamb's group in 2002, talking about ALPI for primary acute angle closure glaucoma as the initial treatment. They compared it to the medical group, which got pilocarpine, timolol, acetazolamide, and if the pressure was higher than 60, they gave the patients mannitol. And the ALPI group had significantly lower IOP at 15, 30, and 60 minutes afterwards. And we can see the curves there. So what does ALPI do in angle closure? Well, you do circumferential treatment. It literally drags the iris out of the angle to gives the TM enough exposure to allow drainage of the aqueous. But because it doesn't eliminate pupillary block, you still have to uh, do an LPI eventually. There's a little bit of nuances that come with it. You wanna place the burns at the periphery of the iris, tangent to the limbus. You depress the pedal until there's no sound. 0 0.5 seconds means you have to hold down on the foot pedal. Lighter irides require more power than darker ones. Blue irides, you have to up the power, sometimes over 300. And if there's pops of iris, just like CPC, you decrease the power. So this is a video from Bob Rich. We can see that he's putting the, the laser nicely in the periphery, tangent to the limbus. This is not an angle closure, but this is just the ideal ALPI type um, video. And this one's posted on YouTube as well. And we can see the nice iris contractions, pulling out the iris out of the angle. So this is similar to endocycloplasty, which Ike has popularized. Endocycloplasty is lasering the ciliary body to pull the iris back. Of course, this is not lasering the iris, but it's a similar type situation where you're opening up the angle. What's the classic teaching of acute angle closure attacks, all right? So this is from the most popular resident manual of management. It's to place drops and give oral medications until the attack is broken. But let's be honest, this could take hours. And during that time, the patient's in pain, and so is the resident, because it's usually the resident sitting there. And you've got time and resources wasted, and it's really causing a lot of mental and physical anguish. And after you've done that so many times, then on the bottom they say, if the IOP does not decrease after two courses, then a laser YAG PI should be considered. So should it be done or shouldn't it be done or should it be done or should it be done with an argon or should it be done with the YAG? Okay, so not so clear. Ike, I just wanted to present this case for you. This is a 59-year-old woman that was visiting New York from Japan and she developed left eye pain, nausea, vomiting. Her vision was 2150. Her pressure was 58 at 3 p.m. She got brinzolamide, bromomidine, timolol, and latanoprost, and she was on no oral medications. And in those days, we were doing paper charts, and these are this is my handwriting here. 
There's two plus NS with two plus MCE trace injection, glaucum flecken, shallow anterior chamber with irritated trabecular contact 360 degrees. So this is September of 2009 and I wasn't attending in July of 2009. So the boss is out of town and I call the boss and he says, go straight to Alpi. Prefer peripheral iris contraction procedure is another name for it. So the boss said it, so that's what I did. I did 12 shots of Alpi. At 435, the pressure was 19. At 535, the pressure was 17. Put her on the drops and then said, come back in one day. The next day, vision 2030, pressure of six, no pain, vision improved. At that point, I did the laser idotomy in the left eye. Day two, vision was great. Pressure was nine. And at that point, I did the laser idotomy in the left eye. This is a day one UBM prior to LPI. We can see that she's got a convex iris and with irritated trabecular contact. So this is prior to her LPI. It looks like a routine kind of convex iris, narrow angle case, maybe a little bit of anterior position ciliary body. So the question to the audience is this, what do you think a UBM of an eye with an angle closure attack looks like after irritoplasty only? So before I move on to the next slide, if everyone could just imagine in their brain, visualize in your brain what a UBM looks like after the patient only got irritoplasty without iridotomy. And this is what it looks like. So after UBM in the left eye, after Alpi, uh, sorry, UBM left eye after Alpi and prior to LPI, essentially the patient has a concave iris plastered up against a lens iris diaphragm. Now we see this in certain situations such as pigmentary glaucoma, pigment dispersion syndrome, and also when you're doing cataract surgery and you have pupillary block with high pressure and we know you have to lift up the iris in that situation. I was really amazed when I saw this picture. And it's, it's stuck with me ever since. And I always show my residents and fellows this. So you have a patient that comes in like this and her, her, her situation resolved, by the way. She went back to Japan. She was visiting her daughter after her daughter gave birth. And you see a patient like this. And do you call this bad alpi? When you have mid-peripheral iris burns, we have to take a closer history. And no, the patient had an acute angle closure crisis and had alpi. The iris was bunched up in the angle and is now restored to a more, more anatomical position. And what was those peripheral burns are now dragged in the mid-periphery region with the restored iris. Not all irises become ischemic and you know, non-reactive after acute angle closure attacks. Ike, I know you love pro tips. So in acute angle closure, here's the pro tip. Have to do the uh, iridotomy in the nasal temporal position. That was a subject of your prism rounds earlier, superior or nasal with Shaquille, right? But in angle closure, you're having so much pain. It's so static. The cornea is swollen. If you do it at 12 o'clock, the bubbles and pigment just gather at 12 o'clock. So absolutely have to do it in the temporal area. And then the bubbles and the pigment start floating up. What's another pro tip? Can't do YAG have to use argon and then switch to YAG because the iris is simply too swollen and boggy. I consider YAG to be like dynamite, whereas argon is like a shovel. So the argon digs like a shovel and digs and digs and digs. Those are the settings there. And then once you dug as deep as possible, as much as you can, then you switch to YAG. Now the setup requires, it depends on what instrument you have. If you have a separate argon and a separate YAG machine, I like to do the argon first of the iridotomy digging, then I do the iridoplasty, then you move the patient over to the YAG machine and open up the YAG laser. If you have a combined YAG argon laser, you can switch the settings back and forth. So all of this is coming out of Asia. They've done so much work there and they've got a clinical study coming up called LPIP, Laser Peripheral Iridotomy Plus, which is plus ALPI. So what am I trying to say, Ike? I think ALPI is a situational ACE, and it is extremely underutilized in the Western world. ALPI with or without LPI needs to be considered for acute angle closure attacks due to pupillary block, and I believe that very soon we will be having a paradigm shift. Thank you. Great, man. You hit that one home pretty hard, and I think I'm glad you did because I have to admit, um, 
even in our practice, we don't use it as much as I think we could. And uh, I think you've raised a real good argument. Um, there's been a couple of questions that came up here. What if the cornea is so edematous or is there a threshold that you wait before attempting it when the cornea is edematous in doing a, a laser peripheral iridoplasty? Yeah, the beauty about iridoplasty is that it is so easy to do. It is way easier to do than an iridotomy. You're doing way fewer argon laser burns. The precision is not there because all you need to do is get the burn focused, the laser focused on the surface of the iris and the laser does itself. The worst that could happen is you laser the anterior cornea. But if we're used to doing laser iridotomies, it's almost not possible for that to happen. But you're right. It is hazy, right? But we all know that the cornea is going to be less hazy in the periphery, let's say. It gets through. It gets through. It's not a precise laser, right? So that's why you're buying time. The alternative is you sit there for literally hours. And let's be honest, like it's not me or you sitting there. It's the residents sitting there, right? Literally all night for hours on end. Meanwhile, the patient's in pain. The family's sitting there like, is there anything else you can do? There's almost no downside to doing an iridoplasty in these cases. That's great. Um, I just want to add one more point that if you have a lot of PAS, so you, I mean, I know you wrote that as a contraindication, but often it's hard to see that. I mean, I, I'm sure like, like us, we like to do imaging if we can, like get an OCT as soon as you can, and that may help you. But have you ever seen situations where an ALPI maybe didn't work or, or you know, IOP spiked up or had other issues, maybe because of the angle being zipped up? Have you, any particular risk to inform the audience about yeah, um, in terms of uh, it not working, certainly, right? Because it, you know, these intractable angle closure cases, and we have another one prepared for you uh, later on, kind of about that. If they're gonna, if they have so much positive pressure in the back, say their malignant component or superciliary fluid or something, it's gonna keep on coming, right? And it's relentless, right? So you can kind of cure it uh, initially, and they might go back into angle closure depending on the mechanism, right? But in my experience, honestly, and you know what's come out of Asia is that you know when you're dealing with that, here we are, acute angle closure patient, and you do iridoplasty, it almost, you know, I'm not going to say always 100%, but you know, it, it you know, it, it's really amazing. That's why I just feel so like I need to share this to everyone because you know this has come out like way back then, right? But here ZAP is all of a sudden, we're not doing iridotomies at all because of ZAP. Granted, ZAP is a huge trial and it was a great study, but like that has completely shifted that. But, you know, why is iridoplasty not, you know, more out there in terms of angle closure management? Well, I'm glad you presented it. I see Mohamed Al Mala, um, our friend from Ocala, Florida, uh, who's loving it as well. So um, I think, I hope you're given some in the audience here, something to think about uh, and consider it. Um, I know we have a lot of cases, so we'll move forward. Just one last thing again, sorry. What about in chronic angle closure? Do you use it in chronic angle closure as well in certain cases? Uh, yeah, for those large PAS and chronic angle closure, no, because you and I know that, you know, it's not dragging that out, right? So, you know, if it is plateau iris syndrome or something like that, you can use it. But if it's chronic angle closure, then you got to take out the cataract. And I believe like Iacogonia sinuculisis is the way for that. Awesome. Great way to, great, great, great lead off case, man. Right, right to the point. All right, Ian. All right. I'm going to heckle you for your whole talk, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> you would, you would. <laughs> yeah, thanks again. Chris, Chris, I want to mention Matt, one thing. You, you, know, you showed some pictures before when you, you know, that tribute. Dude, man, you, you're, you're getting better looking as you get older, buddy. <laughs> it's true. I, I'll be honest. I mean, okay. No, no one wants to chime in here. Just me. Okay, fine. Fine. No, it's doing something. <laughs> God, it's looking good, man. You, you weren't ugly back then, but you, you're, you know, yeah. Not everyone. That's usually the reverse, man. Sophistication comes with age, is what it sounds like. <laughs> so we got Ian up to bat. I think I hear. Yes. Yes. Good, looking uh, forward to this. All right. All right, so this is a case of a 66-year-old woman, uh, past medical history significant only for diabetes. She had no previous ocular history. Her, the vision in the left eye was light perception with a pressure of 10. The axial length was about symmetrical between uh, each eye. And B-scan was performed. The retina was uh, uh, 
shown to be flat with no Reynolds attachment. So at this point, I'll uh, pull the audience here and uh, just ask what your favorite technique is to prevent the Argentinian flag scenario. Let's do a chat again. Sorry, this is a bit of a surprise poll, but put your answer in the chat. Yeah, the, the, these are certainly uh, tough cases. I, I'm wondering while they do this, Ian and others, do you use any preoperative imaging to give you an idea about the liquidity or the you know um, amount of fluid in the capsular bag? Have you found it to be helpful at all? I mean, I haven't uh, generally done that. I try to get an idea at the slit lamp, um, but honestly, with the technique that I'll be talking about here, I. I honestly haven't really needed to know precisely how uh, liquefied it is. Um, but, you know, I'll do, a, I'll kind of knock on the slit lamp to see if there's any movement there. Um, but uh, yeah, the, 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 the beauty of this technique is that uh, it sort of works with whatever type of cataract is there. Yeah, yeah looking forward to that. I, I would just add that, you know, if you have an A scan, you can see the, look at the interlenticular spikes, look for any fluid uh, tissue levels, or of course, if you have a UBM or anterior OCT, you can often see that. I, I, I still agree with you. I think just when you see this, just be prepared. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned a lot of things here. The, the chat group is lighting up with all kinds of things. <laughs> um, you see, we got a lot of, a lot of fours in there, a lot of fours and fives, I think, Matt, is that what you're seeing too? Yeah, needle yeah. aspiration is a common one. Going in there with that needle yeah. and aspirating, we got a couple of uh, super viscous viscoelastics, um, and a spiral rex. Rexus is common. Decompressing pars planar first. Interesting. I, someone wrote that one in there too. And you got uh, you got some folks, <laughs> maybe some Yale folks, talking about phaco capsulotomy. I see this here. Um, so you got a lot, a lot of wide ranging votes. I think uh, the majority are needle aspiration. It looks like. And that's more or less what we expected to. All right, so I got a short video here. So when confronted with the white cataracts, I'll start by injecting tripan, followed by a viscodispersive agent. And usually I'm on the continuous irrigation, but in this case, I'll enter the interior chamber dry and then use the phaco tip to simultaneously puncture the anterior capsule and remove a portion of the cortex on the scope setting. And then I'll make additional passes. In this case, there are about three passes uh, until I'm convinced that the cataract is sufficiently depress depressurized. Now I start to come out with the irrigation on, but Chris stops me there and you know, we come out dry. And that's just to prevent a change in the pressure and potentially allowing the cataract to prolapse upward and then tear the capsule that way. And then you just grab a free edge of the uh, capsule, complete your rexus. You, you showed here an important point though, that you still you still protected yourself and started a bit small. Right. It looks like right. you kind of spiraled out. We had a case like this and got through the first part, but then as you get around that third corner, you kind of get a bit lackadaisical and it ran out. One of our, one of the cases that I was supervising so I think, you know, it's a good pearl still. Very nice, man. Yeah, very, very, so. yeah you, got, you guys are starting off with some bang-to-bang -bang controversies here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other important point there in the video is burping the wound before the uh, hydrodissection uh, just to uh, prevent blowing the, the capsule out that way. Uh, but, uh, and also another, another technique too is to uh, uh, use the vertical chop uh, with these dense cataracts. Uh, yeah, I prefer to create maybe about eight segments there to, to remove. And, and uh, during the uh, sculpting process also to uh, use a pulse uh, technique to uh, uh, limit the, uh, the risk of the uh, wound burn. But yeah, fortunately the rest of the case went routinely and uh, there are no complications. Yeah, the only thing I'm gonna add my commentary, cause I, th I think that, you know, well done, really well done would be just when you came out there, I saw you kind of waited a bit, which is good. Um, and I think you probably were fine because I don't think you removed lots of viscoelastic, but I always tell our fellows and residents, when you come out in these cases, fill the eye up with the, with your non-dominant hand, just to keep the chamber yeah. deep. Cause yep. sometimes, you know, if the chamber shallows too much, then it can run out when you had an irregular capsulotomy. But I presume you had 
enough OBD in the anterior chamber because you weren't really, you had low fluidics, right? You were in sculpt mode, like you said. So you probably were fine, right. but just one, one little small thing, maybe just to keep that chamber formed before coming out with your phaco probe, just with some more viscoelastic. But I, I mean, yeah. great demonstration. I, I think you got to have a lot of guts, I guess, for that one. I, I already see some people <laughs> texting me privately even saying, um, yeah, you know, that's pretty gutsy. Yeah, I mean, when I first, when when Chris first had me do it in fellowship, it was very nerve wracking, but uh, uh, I can't really speak enough to how kind of foolproof it is. Uh, I mean, as soon as I did it, uh, it was only one time, one time was all I needed to be comfortable with it and continue doing it. And I haven't uh, done anything else since starting in private practice. And I've, I've done about 30 of these uh, white cataracts so far in a last year and a year and a half. And I've yet to encounter the Argentinian flag sign. So I'm, and, I'm um, definitely very, the very question grateful. About, is, is there a risk of going through the PC? Uh, I presume it's, you know, it's a question that was asked here. What, what are your thoughts on that? It, it is a good question. I mean, the, uh, uh, the one case that scared me a little bit was uh, the, the cataract ended up being so uh, milky that as soon as I entered it, it essentially sucked it up immediately. And I was a little nervous. The, uh, the posterior capsule could have been uh, punctured that way, uh, but, but it was fine. Um, it, you know, it's definitely, you know, I think, like you said, if you have some idea of how uh, liquefied the, the, the lenses going into it, that can, that can help you to um, just uh, have it in the back of your mind. Uh, but really only one time has, has that been a concern but I guess it is a remote possibility. Well, Chris, uh, you, you put out a, you put out a pretty bold statement here, going right to FACO and doing this. Uh, it looks like you got some 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 pearls to share, and I think uh, I know that Ian already mentioned it, but it might be worth reviewing the settings because that's probably an important aspect of of doing this safely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great points there. Uh, I'll show a picture of the settings uh, when you come out. I always teach my residents and fellows the super grip position um, like this where you where you hold the heel on like this and then you're using your thumb to inject because we're usually holding it like this but when you're when you're like this it's really hard to go there and when you're down at the at so I hold I just call this super grip where you're holding the heel on there so whenever I say super grip to them it's they have a really good grip on that to inject if they need to come out in any type of situation so I'm glad Mohammed Mohammed El Mala is here because I got one of his videos here. So thanks Mohammed for sharing with me that um, a few years back. So Argentinian flag sign named by Dr. Daniel Mario Perón and won awards at Ascaris and ESCRS. And we, we know it's due to the outward pressure due to the intumescent lens that causes the capsule rexes to tear out. And in conjunction with the tripan blue stain, it mimics the blue white blue pattern of the Argentina flag. So this is Mohammed's video that he posted on YouTube and as the rexus is being propagated to just so much overwhelming pressure. There must have been audio in that one that was uh, bleeped out, right? <laughs> Mohammed. <laughs> Speak in the chat, Mohammed. Great video. Um, yeah, I've seen that before, unfortunately, back in the day. And this is why it's called Argentinian flag sign. Shout out to Diego Maradona at this point. For the young youngsters, look up greatest goal in history on YouTube. So how can it be defeated, Ike? So here we are, mannitol, acetazolamide, the oldie but goodie Honan balloon, which we used when I was a, a resident. Jack Dodick taught me how to use that. Femtosecond laser. Intraoperative, heavy viscoelastic, double rexus, spiral rexus, decompression, precision pulse capsulotomy using the capsule rexus device or phaco capsulotomy. So this is a video of a needle decompression. And you take a 27 gauge needle and you stick it through the center. And if you have one of these liquefied lenses, it's going to come out just as nicely as in this video. But as we know, Cataracts are like a box of cataracts are like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get in there, right? So what might be white and liquefied looking could actually be hard once you get in there. We know that, right? So this one happens to be liquefied and perfect demonstration of a 27 gauge needle decompression. 
the Rex is able to be done, but look at the outside. It's just so milky, but the inside is a rock. So, right, so you got to mix in some vertical chops as needed. Sometimes you do phaco cap and the thing just immediately comes out in the younger patients. So what is phaco capsulotomy? Well, that's where you insert the phaco through an in tap capsule and sculpt. And it's essentially equal to decompression with the 27 gauge needle, except the 27 gauge needle is the phaco handpiece. So I was studying the phaco um, Ache video that Ike has on YouTube, the live surgery, and they did an interview with him in the end. And, you know, what were the keys to success? And Ike's, he said, imagination, right? Preparation, visualization. So imagination. So let's imagine the phaco handpiece as a giant 27 gauge needle with super aspiration and vacuum capability. So how do you do it? So after you put the tripam in, I like to go in dry, not irrigating. You center the bevel, either bevel up or bevel down. I've done both. I typically are doing it um, bevel up. And then you can use the second instrument to stabilize the eye because sometimes these chambers are really shallow. So it wants to run away from you. You battle back by dropping your hand and pulling the eye um, towards you when you drop your hand, but it still might be running away. So you use a second instrument and pull that towards you. So here are the settings here. I have two machines. One is the older version and one is the new one. It's literally just the sculpt setting here. And look at that picture. So as you're going through the capsule, you're just stepping down and you just continue with the groove. And what that does is essentially what the 27 gauge needle does and it's super aspiration ability. So it's gonna suck out whatever liquid is there. And then when you do multiple passes, you remove the handpiece and the pro tip Ike is come out. I mean, uh, don't come out irrigating, right? You have viscoelastic in there, you kick right, equalize the pressure, then come out. Otherwise, the anterior chamber can shallow, and then you might cause Argentinian. There's so much positive pressure. You can do um, the super grip injection as well, like Ike mentioned. So that's a pro tip just to be dry when um, you're coming out. Then you inject viscoelastic, and then you start doing the rexus, grab and go. So here are the complications, possibility, Ike. Sculpt through the nucleus, PC tear. It's just no way, right? Because imagine if there is no capsule rexus there, you're not going to all of a sudden, you know, go so deep. Can you cause on your dehiscence? No, not if there's it's already present because you're not really doing anything that you're not doing when you're sculpting. So can you still get Argentinian flag sign? And the answer to that is yes, right? But I wouldn't consider that a complication because literally you're going to get that anyway had you not done any prophylaxis. So this is where I tell the residents, you know, do you want to be like a lemming and just walk off the cliff? Or do you want to actively intervene and try to do something that may or may not happen? So what's the only complication that I've experienced is right here. Look at the wound there as I go in there, right? So that's a wound burn. So it essentially what happens is that, you know, you, you, you hit like a, a dense nucleus and then the wound can light up. So how can you prevent this? You can use pulse or burst mode. You can step on or off. Ian and I came up with soft shell technique because dispersive might, um, you know, be clogging the phaco handpiece. So this is one of these particularly like fibrotic capsules. You see it shoots out on me because of that anterior subcapsular cataract. I do the little procedure here and it still shoots really fast on me. Fortunately, I have a malugan. I visualize there. And then as I'm pulling that around, I feel it going out on me again right there. And I'm like, oh man. So I better little that again. So I'm able to uh, do another little procedure. And then fortunately, I can just grab that other flap there. And this one I call the Australia Rexus. And then, you know, you see how dense it is. And this was the lens I was using at that time. And the case went well with mild wound burn, put in two stitches, did well. So I think it's a relatively safe procedure, Ike. It's a small learning curve. The residents all are doing it. It's low cost. You need to be comfortable with the rexus in either direction. So the unpredictable nature of where's the flap going to be, right? So I think you go um, backhand clockwise, Ike. I typically go counterclockwise as a righty because it's the forehand position. And, you know, when, when you're hitting the tennis ball, most mm -hmm. people like to go forehand. So that's why I'm going um, counterclockwise usually. But you know, you have to be comfortable in either direction with the capsorexis. And I think this defeats Argentinian flag sign almost every time. Thank you.
Great pearls, Chris. And I, I think those are some really good reviews. Um, and I think you've described it really well. I think we just got to be really cognizant of uh, equalizing that pressure and, and resolving it. And I think uh, whether it's a needle or a phaco tip, I, I, I do agree that I think it does take a bit of guts and you showed, you know, you, you got some pretty good, uh, strong, um, you know, strong, strong forces in there, which is really great to see the technique. Um, I think the comments have been kind of what you've already covered. Um, there's some comments about femto laser. I don't know what your experience has been with femto laser and white cataracts. I know Kathy's here. I think she talked about that a little bit. Um, a variety of different ways, but this is certainly, as you said, a low cost, simple way. Everyone has it technology there. And I noticed on the one video there that, you know, where you enter probably is important, right? I mean, you probably want to enter right in the middle of the capsular bag. If you go too sub incisional and the rex just kind of runs a bit inferior or sub incisional, then that may be harder to recover. So, you know, even with a needle, I, I make sure we go right in the middle uh, of that, of that capsular bag. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we're going to have a lot of people trying this, uh, trying this technique. You got people doing ALPIs and phaco capsulotomies. I don't know what's next. Like but, I've uh, had issues. I've had issues with the needle, right? Because look at the angle you're coming in from the main wound, and the needle's going down here. If the needle was coming straight up and down and causing a perfect circle, right? But the needle makes actually like a linear slit, right? Yes, so true. one time before I was doing phaco cap, I went in with the needle, and then it just shot out on me because it was linear not like a perfect circle. So one of the techniques is like a mini rexus, but that's so hard with under positive pressure, right? So that's why I switched to phaco cap because the needle, I just didn't feel like was doing it. Plus, because you don't know what's inside the cataract makeup, right? Sometimes it's like really dense, right? You don't know if it's gonna be liquefied or really dense and there's various pockets in there. And that's why the, the uh, phaco tip is gonna you know, give you that super aspiration ability. Yeah, it's great. And, and I think, you know, some people mentioned the super viscous cohesive. I think that that certainly helps to give you a bit of an advantage by really almost creating a concave anterior capsule when you do your technique. Um, and I personally, if I use a needle, I go 25 gauge bevel down to try to get right in there and aspirate. But uh, yeah, I, I, hey, I can't, I can't argue about this technique. And I think the wound burn was one question that I had, and I think it was raised in the chat group as well. Um, and you kind of addressed that. Uh, considering what viscoelastic you use and consider your settings as well. Make sure you have flow. Yeah, I, I think still use a soft shell. shell. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I still I use know, a soft you, shell just in case. Are you case, torsional? It... torsional that, probably, yeah. that probably also reduces your What's risk that? if you do some torsional in there. Oh, yeah. Than only latinal. Great. Yeah, I, I've gotten, I've just gotten burned before, no pun intended, uh, using the uh, visco dispersive alone. So just ever since then, I've I've just done a soft shell. I think it makes sense. Awesome. Okay. Well, looking forward to number to, to the third case. Thank you, Ian, for, for starting that. Sure. Well, yeah. Um, thanks again for uh, having these eye rounds and, um, you know, giving us something to do during the COVID pandemic and, and just letting us have an opportunity to learn throughout it. And uh, thanks again for letting us share a couple of things here and there. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick case presentation. Uh, it came in on an afternoon, so it was just another routine afternoon um, up until uh, it was June 5th, 2020. And, you know, the COVID pandemic, the surge had just kind of ended um, and we were getting back into the clinics. We were all eager to kind of have some surgeries and, and continue seeing patients uh, when this 46 year old female came in with a red and painful right eye. She had a history of developmental delay um, and an extensive history of self-inflicted trauma, including banging of her head against walls and just against her fist and so forth. We saw her in the office and, an exam, and we planned for an exam under anesthesia as well as concomitant surgery at that time. Uh, in the office, you know, it was a little hard to assess visual acuity because of the developmental delay, but she was at least responding to light. Um, the IOP, the right eye was very, very firm, uh, estimated to be in the 50s. And the left eye, funny enough, was completely unremarkable. Um, and these are some of the pictures from our exam under anesthesia. So uh, we can see in figure A and B, this is the aerial and the side view. Um, and we can see, you know, there's a little bit of injection um, and we can see a pretty mature cataract and it looks like it's kind of prolapsed into the anterior chamber. Um, and it, uh, frankly, just looking from these pictures and, and the gonioscopy in figure C, C, it's hard to appreciate any um, anterior chamber at all. So naturally, the next thing we decided to do was both a B scan and a UBM. The B scan, uh, again, fortunately, was completely flat. Um, we didn't appreciate any tumors or anything like that. Um, the left eye was very unremarkable again, but the right eye, um, we can see it here. Um, the lens appears to be in front of the iris right here. 
Um, and we can see it's a pretty advanced looking cataract. You know, there's probably a little bit of uh, uh, liquefaction in the center of it. Um, and we can see that there's pretty much absolutely no anterior chamber. The lens is taking it up in its entirety. Um, so in summary, you know, you have to have a finding for your exam and your anesthesia. So what we found was a difficult journey was gonna lie ahead of us. Um, I'll take a second just to see what people write in chat um, in, in terms of what their next moves might be or what, what things they'd be worried about and what things they'd be addressing um, before I go on. Great. Well, <laughs> I, I, like your, I like your G case, but I, I think certainly uh, Yale and Chris are well able to handle these. That, that, that is an impressive UBM uh, and an impressive lateral, lateral review of that, of that anterior segment. Incredible, incredible position of that lens. I guess, I guess you're probably going to get a lot of discussion about what's the mechanism, what's going on. Um, looks like we have a lot of... Uh, no, you guys can't... <laughs> guys, come on. <laughs> That's not Not an option here. We strongly considered G, but it was the COVID pandemic. Cases <laughs> in America were much worse than Canada. We didn't want to um, you know, send her over there. So it looks like you got some mannitol, uh, IV mannitol uh, listed here for some people. Pars plana vitri vitrectomy decompression is listed here as well. Um, so you have a lot of different. Do you remember what the axial length was, Sosha? Uh, so it was. It wasn't. Uh, obscenely short. It was uh, around the 21 point like seven, eight range, 21.8. Uh, and it was pretty symmetric on the other. I think one side was 21.4 and one side was 21.8. Um, so it wasn't, you know, obscene. it wasn't below 20 or anything like that. And you got a few, you got a few ABCs. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we considered, you know, all these options and more, uh, frankly, you know, seeing her in clinic and then seeing the uh, UBM uh, was a, a little bit of an exciting surprise for us. Um, so what we ended up kind of going for was um, C, D, and E. We decided to proceed and do, to do the cataract surgery. Um, and because the anterior chamber was just filled up and, and with this lens and it, we were, the eye was rock hard. We were expecting it to be very difficult to reform. We decided to do a pars plana vitrectomy decompression um, as well as a IZHV. Um, so I'm gonna show a little, uh, a short clip of video just highlighting those two parts um, as well as tidbits of the rest of the case before further discussion as well. So here we're measuring out about 10 millimeters and marking our vitrector probe going inside to that 10 millimeter mark and then performing the vitrectomy while palpating the eye until the desired IOP is reached. We move the vitrector over and kind of push up to confirm our location uh, on the iris. And then we perform the IZHV as well. And you can kind of see uh, the vitrector coming through uh, at that arrow point in particular. After that, we were able to deepen the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. We had to use the vitrector to create the capsulotomy because it was so fibrotic, but we remo I removed the nucleus and we ended up with an intact bag, but it was in front of the iris. So we decided to remove it and do an anterior vitrectomy and give her an anterior chamber intraocular lens. And um, fortunately for us at the end, this is what her eye looked, for, uh, looked like. Um, and we saw her just recently uh, at her post-op month for visit um, and she was pain free and what we call, you know, 20 happy. She seemed pretty happy and um, she was doing well overall. Um, so a couple of interesting things in that respect, um, but uh, would have loved to hear what your approach would have been or what uh, any of the panelists uh, approaches would have been as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to say, man. I mean, <laughs> you're very calm uh, narrating that case, but I'm sure in the middle of it, uh, hearts are sure. pounding. During um, the case, there was a lot of, uh, you know, discussion. And after the UBM, there was, you know, exploded, uh, you know. So I, I, I'm really, I'm really, I'm curious about whether you needed to do an IZHV before removing the lens, because that, that I have to say is a, is a pretty tough move. Now, the advantage you had is you had the whole lens in the anterior chamber. So it's not like you could actually probably damage the, uh, the lens very much because you already had the lens anteriorly. But I would worry a little bit about, because I find when I do IZHVs, I'm invariably, cutting some peripheral capsule. It's really hard to avoid that. So, um, so I, I think we got, curious. so in some sense we got lucky quote unquote. So what we did actually was um, uh, I did the vitrectomy and then we tried to reform the anterior chamber but it was still just not reforming. And that's why we decided to pursue the IZHV as well. Um, again, we got in some sense lucky just cause as you said the lens was in the uh, anterior chamber so we could visualize where the capsule was a lot easier than if it was behind the iris. 
Um, and we were able to kind of just veer out towards the side. It's helpful to have the vitrector kind of marked so you kind of have some sense of how far you're going. Um, but before we, before I did the IZHV, I was palpating up just to confirm, oh, okay, it's behind the iris. It, it looks like it's an okay spot and so forth and so forth. But uh, it does take um, a, a little bit of courage for sure. Yeah, I would imagine that once you do a bit of VIT, you probably are going to deepen that chamber, right? You should be able to, unless you have, you know, a, a choroidal mechanism, like a large hemorrhage or something um, to do that. But uh, I mean, that did the trick for you. And I, I mean, I'm impressed that the bag was maintained. That, that, is, uh, that, that, is, that is impressive, I must say. Well done. Ike, do you think um, if we did an extra cap in this case, because we were debating that like with a pressure of 50, like, and you do an extra cap and the eye literally starts bleeding, like when you take out the lens because it explodes or something like. Well, that, that's, that's what I've, um, that's what I see some folks, some folks have asked that question. What about extra cap or even, you know, small incision uh, manual, right? Manual small incision. Um, I, I see that being a, an option for folks. I agree with you. I, I think an incision and a large incision is asking for, real, real potential problems. Um, and, and I've seen situations where you open it up and then really, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't close that thing because you have so much loss of decompression. I think having a closed system is such an advantage in these cases here. So I, I would do as much as I can to avoid that. I, I agree with you. I would avoid that. I know that uh, it's an option depending on what, what you see. Um, but if you can try to really avoid that, I think that would really save potential, you know, serious consequences. I agree with you. We were debating question. that, and I was really scared, honestly, because I'm just like, if we extra cap this, like, I feel like the, the, it's going to start massively bleeding because there was so much positive pressure there. So yeah, I, I agree. And often these cases, I mean, the uh, and Kathy's adding a comment here about CTR and segments. I mean, the zonules can be poor in these cases. So, you know, and, and one of the differentials, by the way, in this case could be zonular weakness. I, I had a colleague recently, just this week, actually, who had a case of a unilateral angle closure. And it turned out that basically it was weak zonules and the lens was moved forward, you know, and it was a spherophagic lens. So I think being prepared for, for zonulopathy in these cases is important with capsule retractors, segment CTRs. I think those are all, all valuable points. Uh, these, are, these, are, these can be surprises, man. Again, congratulations on, on a very difficult case. Uh, some people would look at that case and go, you know what? Forget it. Let's just go to cyclodiode. You know, honestly, people, some people would do that. I'm not saying it's wrong. Depending on the patient, maybe they were a poor surgical candidate. Some would go right, right to Cyclo, say, you know what, done, Cyclo, you know, just get the, get the eye pain free. But, um, but getting that lens is certainly the problem here. What are your thoughts in terms of, so we ended up placing an anterior chamber lens, but uh, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of placing a, an ACIOL versus a scleral suture? We were a little hesitant on scleral suturing, giving her a history of trauma and kind of headbanging and so forth. Uh, we were afraid it would kind of like fall back or something like that, but... It's a tough call. Um, I mean, again, we talked about making a larger incision on the risk, so I'd be a little bit worried. I mean, you got a six millimeter incision. Mm -hmm. um, that would give me a little bit of pause for concern. I, I would certainly be okay leaving the patient aphakic, honestly, and come back another day. I know it sounds a little bit like uh, I gave up a bit, but I think that would be, that would be okay um, and reassess. Maybe the visual potential isn't there anyways. I don't know, and you come back and do another technique. If the eye is very small, of course, as you know, an entry chamber lens is not a good idea with the with the entry segment. But this sounds like it probably was relatively normal. Um, but otherwise, I I have I've had success, you know, doing a scleral fixated technique. Um, you know, using a Yamani now is what our preference is, and that's probably what I would have looked at. But I would have no problem here leaving the patient aphakic. I, I would be more than happy doing that. Um, you know, in that situation. Perfect. But uh, you know, hey, you can't can't argue with with what you what you achieved here. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. Very well, uh -huh. very good. Great. Wow. I mean, the, you, you, got, you got some amazing cases here, Chris. Wow. What a team. That was done in June. That was like a COVID special. We just opened up June, June 1st, and that came June 5th, so that was nice. Martin Spencer, who has a lot of experience with, uh, with small incision uh, manual in the, in the developing world and also here, has spoken about sterile tunnels and being able to do this with a safe sterile tunnel approach and designing that wound right. And I would recommend watching some of his and other videos about that as an option if you were gonna do something manual. So it's a good point. Thank you. So I'll hand the baton off to um, Eileen to present a, another interesting case uh, where these techniques may come in handy. You pretty, you pretty well have the audience glued to the screen, I guarantee you.
Uh, and you see, look at the comments. Awesome cases. These are totally amazing. Um, uh, uh, Natalie Taboul is asking about the IOL power. Did you have biometry? Uh, so we were lucky during the exam under anesthesia, um, we were able to do an axial length and get some kerat uh, keratometry. Um, and so we used that to kind of estimate a, a IOL. Um, and then, you know, fortunately at Yale, you know, there's a stockpile of AC IOLs and MAs and SN60s and so forth and so forth. Um, so that's what, how we got to the IOL. All right, uh, so uh, I'll go on and present my case. I just wanna thank Ike, Matt, and Ricky again for having us here tonight. It's such an honor to be here with my friends from the Glaucoma Interview Trail. And of course, such an honor to be here with the awesome Ike Ahmed presenting with everyone. So uh, I'm just going to talk about a tough case that I had this year. So this is a 62 year old Caucasian male who was seen by an outside ophthalmologist. He initially presented with acute loss of vision, 10 out of 10 pain in the left eye, in addition to associated headache and photophobia. His pressure in the left eye on that day was 47 to 60. So she went ahead and did a YAG LPI, attempted three locations, then sent him home on uh, bromonidine timolol and prednisolone. The following day, he came back for follow-up. His pressure in the left eye was 50 to 60. A repeat LPI was performed, this time with argon pretreatment in an attempt to coagulate the vessels and also tampen out the bogginess of the iris. And after that, the IOP was still elevated. So she did a paracentesis, IOP came down to 25. She sent the patient to Yale ED for urgent evaluation. Past medical history included hypertension, no past ocular history, and the only medication was Valsartan. So on exam, the vision was 20-25 on the right, light perception in the left eye. The left eye was dilated at five millimeters and reactive with one plus RAPD. The left eye also had a lot of corneal edema. It was one to two corneal thicknesses deep. Uh, very shallow, also shallow in the right eye, three to four corneal thicknesses. They both had anterior bowing of the iris. The left eye had three non-patent LPIs with a lot of debris, clots, haziness in the anterior chamber. No obvious neovascularization. On gonioscopy, the right eye was grade one with scleral spur. The left eye had no structures, 360 degrees of angle closure. The right eye had a 0.3 nerve. There was no view to the left eye. A B scan of both eyes were unremarkable, showing no vitreal retinal pathology, nothing in the back. So what is the differential diagnosis in this case? Uh, all, all of the below were considered for acute unilateral rise in IOP, but in this case, we thought acute angle closure was pretty likely. So what should be done at this point? Anything from IOP lowering drops to paracentesis, zetazolamide, hyperosmotic uh, agent, corneal indentation, LPI, ALPI. These are all discussed, and you guys all mentioned that great discussion earlier. And in this case, we had to pull them all out. All of the above were performed on this patient. Uh, so uh, we started with IOP lowering drops, gonioscopy indentation. We did the LPI, ALPI with the argon and YAG combined laser. Um, 30 minutes later, the IOP was still 40, so IV mannitol was administered. Two hours after the IV mannitol, the IOP was still 40, so AC paracentesis was done. So really did do all of the above. Very briefly, IV mannitol increases intravenous osmolality, essentially dehydrating the vitreous, thinking that it would help decrease all the posterior pressure. It acts usually pretty quickly, five to 10 minutes, lasting up to six hours. Of course, in some cases, like in this patient, the IOP still remains intractable. So AC paracentesis can create aqueous outflow and immediate relief. So the following day, the patient's IOP came down to 28 and was sustained days later. So um, three days after, uh, gonioscopy of the left eye showed it was open to trabecular meshwork. Uh, LPI of the fellow eye was performed. And then, you know, as it sometimes things happen, the patient did not return to his follow ups. We called him several times, wasn't sure about medication adherence, et cetera. 
Then he comes back about two and a half weeks later. Pressure was 52 in that left eye and gonioscopy showed 360 degrees, iridotrabecular contact with scattered PAS. So repeat LPI LP was performed. Then the following day, the IOP was 46. So in this case, I'd like to pull the audience and ask, how would you manage this case of intractable angle closure? Time to, good time to get some poll here. We got some people <laughs> answering here, which is great. I was gonna make one thing, I mean, one thing that I do when I do a presentesis, Mm -hmm. I, I will often use the needle to do a soot lamp gonioscopialysis, or at least pull the iris away from the angle. Uh, I guess you're in there. It's kind of like an iridoplasty in the sense of you're contracting the iris in the sense of pulling it. But I'm already in there, so I'll go in there, and I'll basically kind of just sweep to the center, sweep to the center, sweep to the center. And that may release some synechia. It may certainly remove the iris from the angle. If you get a bit of iris trauma, I think that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And you can do it for 180 degrees. I, it's a bit cavalier, but it's something sometimes we have done. And certainly... Uh, like, like, you know, post graft angle closure from Sneakia or other cases, it's an option at the slit lamp. Uh, oh. As one thing, if you're already in there, I always say 30 gauge needle, go ahead and just, you know, tickle the iris a little bit, right? Get it, get it contracted a bit, maybe, you know. But of course, at this point in time, you're, you're, you're looking at surgery. I totally get it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the pointer. I'll try it next time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's one of the gas things we talk about in our fellowship. I mean, to, 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 to finish off a gas fellowship, you got to be in the eye with a needle, you know. <laughs> Doing a going slit lamp going to see glycis. Chris Tank style, man. That's, that's something Chris would, would like. Like I, I, I saw Arshim present that at AGS, and I, I know you taught him that, and that's such a baller move. I have not done that yet. And uh, under your hands, the patients are just so calm and stuff. With me, they're freaking out and stuff. So, you know. Hey, man, you, you got enough baller action already shown here. Um, a lot of folks are two, okay? Um, Eileen, I think the majority, I would say, are two. Um, basically, uh, you know, uh, FACO with the GSL. That's what the majority are saying. I would say probably everybody's saying that actually. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And definitely we, we did end up doing that as well as an IZHV. And uh, at this point I'll turn to Chris and he'll give a wonderful talk about that. Yeah, this is definitely the Ike move here. And uh, you know, I learned it from him. Uh, prophylactic PPV and IZHV. So the shallow anterior chamber is one of the most challenging situations that an anterior segment surgeon is going to face and results in iris prolapse, capsule rexus tears, corneal decompensation, ruptured PC capsules, retained nucleus, supracoroidal hemorrhages. So how can you defeat this? Here we are again. Honin balloon, mannitol, acetazolamide, helon 5, iris hooks, pars plana tap or pars plana retrectomy. So what is that? So that's controlled debulking of the anterior vitreous and that deepens the anterior chamber and leads to posterior displacement of the lens and reduces the positive pressure. And really you can do this at any time during the cataract surgery, but typically it's done at the beginning of the case because you need to deepen the anterior chamber. So when do you consider it? When there's short axial length, large intumescent lens, or various types of glaucoma that I've listed, phacomorphic acute angle closure, typically, but also nanophthalmos, anterior subluxation, exfoliation, et cetera. What are the steps for that? You can do a retro bobar or a subtenons. Measure 3.5 to 3.75 on the trocar. You can do the sclerosomy um, with an MVR or with the trocar. I typically use a trocar these days. 23 gauge. You use a trocar or a conjunctival incision or 25 gauge, use a trocar. And here's one of the pro tips, Ike. If you have a small pupil, you need to measure um, 10 millimeters on the vitrector because once you go in there, you're going to lose your um, position really quickly. And how much are you removing? Well, you're using your finger to palpate. Uh, vitreous volume, let's remember, is 4 cc. So you're removing maybe 0 0.2 or so, but you're using your finger to palpate and gauge how much you need to remove. Now, here are some various cut rates. In the old days, when I was using one machine with an 800 cut rate, um, you know that, that was not as optimal as the modern machines with the higher cut rates. This new machine that came out has a 4,000 cut rate, and if you use a specialized attractor, it's a 7,500 cut rate. The 20 gauge, you have to suture up because you're using an MVR to go through, but with the trocars, 23 or 25 gauge, and you're using a cut IA setting. And then you remove and leave the incision trocar intact because if you're still having positive pressure during the case, you can go back and remove more vitreous on the back. 
So what are the criteria? This is always a thing that comes up. Like when do you proflex? When do you do these things? Right. And it's a surgeon decision because you honestly don't know if you're going to need it or not. Uh, but I look at a few things, anterior chamber depth, axial length, endothelial cell count, density of the cataract. And if you have angle closure glaucoma and you're in a hot eye with angle closure glaucoma, I think the only way to successfully do that case is to do a pars plana vitreous tap, uh, vitrectomy. So is it safe? This comes up as well. Well, the benefits outweigh the risks, right? Um, if you don't do it, you're probably going to end up with a really challenging anterior segment case, and it decreases positive pressure, protects endothelium, no iris prolapse, and makes the capsulorexis relatively routine. Here are the pro tips, Ike. We want to go in with the radial approach with the retractor, so you don't, definitely don't puncture the lens or capsule. So when you're going in, you have to point towards the nerve. And be sure to measure. Look at this small pupil here that I did, right? Once you go in there, you don't know if you're three millimeters in there, eight, 10, or 15. So that's why you take a marker and score 10 millimeters because it's really easy to lose where you are and use a finger or some other probe to palpate and then leave it open till the end because you always have the option to take out more if you're hitting positive pressure during the case or you can do an IZHV after. So the first mention that I could find of um, ZHV was by Nomi Lois from Belfast. Northern Ireland, and she described this in 2001. And Ike has really popularized this around the world. By the way, Ike, I'm your YouTube fellow. If you didn't know, I'm one of your fellows as well. So thanks so much. Ala Mofti gave a great review of this May 1st, Prism I rounds. These are going to be official references from now on as well. And, you know, they did this great um, uh, paper. Devesh Varma, Graham, and Diamond did that. And they had 18 patients. They were all women. Hyperopia level was plus three, short axial lengths, 21.3, small anterior chamber depths. And out of these patients with malignant glaucoma, two of them were treated with cycloplegic successfully. Seven of them needed iridozonial hyaloidotomy with laser and then resolved. And then six of them were cured with IOL um, viscoelastic injection pushback, which is really hard because you're putting pressure into an eye with pressure and the patient's in so much pain and five of them needed IZHV. Here are the pro tips. So you start with the PPV, and after the PPV is done, you pick the area on the iris. In this case here, I go superiorly because that's where the axis is. And you really have to gauge the distance by moving the retractor back and forth. Because once you're under the iris, you lose your landmark really quick. You'll see in the video that I lose my landmark of where I am. So I'm constantly flashing back and forth into the view of the iris, and then back to the iris, and then you're tilting up. So you see a bulge there and then you just have to go for it. And then you cut and see until you see the tip. And afterwards, don't just come out. If I came out at this point in the picture and I just pulled out there, I would hit the um, zonules and rip those and I could um, create a PC tear on the side, right? So you wanna go out the same way you went in, which is go back towards the middle, go radial down and then come out. And then afterwards you have the option of going in through the front and then enlarging it from the fronts because sometimes these can close up as well. So in Eileen's case, the patient had intractable angle closure glaucoma. We tried all these procedures. So the plan was for cataract extraction with GSL, PPV, and IZHV. And this was just done October 1st. I just show these caliber measures. This is the trocar. It's three on the inside, four on the outside. So we're gonna hit right in between on this, which is about 3.5. This is a tunneling technique with the trocar. If you don't get in like that, then you have to twist and push. And you can use a jab technique as well to give it a little punctate jabs as well. And then I just use a 0.12 here to remove the trocar. We can see some vitreous come out. Here's the measuring. You just want to measure an approximation there with the marker so you know where you are. In this case, the pupil's large. So we can see it, but in those small pupils, you really need to measure because you don't know if you're four in, four millimeters in or 10 millimeters in. Here I'm using a BSS cannula. Steel on cornea won't cause abrasions. Finger won't as well. And you can see that uh, we're just palpating. When you feel like there's enough, you just come out and then you go ahead with the routine cataract. And you're hitting no positive pressure. If you do, you always have the option to go back and remove more vitreous. So the capsule rexus is able to be propagated. Now, if, you, if I hadn't done it and he was, you know, pressure 50 with positive pressure, you'll see the iris just come to the paris straight out 
or the um, iris is going to start coming out of the main wound, and then you know you're in for some real trouble. I always like to decompress some viscoelastic out before I hydrate a set because I don't want to blow out the posterior capsule in these cases. The cataract fortunately came out nicely, able to put in the lens. And at this point, this is what Ike has also popularized, agonia sneakyolysis. So I'm doing a direct view. I didn't have MST forceps available, so I just take a blunt tipped um, instrument here and you can uh, just nicely peel the PAS off. And they peel out real nicely. You can forceps grab it as well, but you can also do that. And, uh, and then I don't have Ike's gonio lens. So to do inferior superior, you just change the angle of the instrument. And then this is indirect gonio sneak lysis as well, where you're just kind of raking the angle there. And then you use the various angles to your advantage and the various wounds. So in this case, I'm able to hit about 270. And you can see the pupil coming down nicely from where it was before at the beginning of the case compared to now when we're actually raking the, um, the iris out of the angle. Then once, once that's done, we're going to go back and do the IZH. So go in radially and then flash towards 12 o'clock. The access points for here are at 12 o'clock or at 6 o'clock. You can do 6 o'clock if there's oil or such, but uh, we're going to go 12 o'clock here. So then you put that retractor there and see I'm flashing. I went so far in, right? So you want to just flash back and forth. And then when you feel like you're in the right position, you start tenting up and then you'll see a bulge here. I was going to go for it. And then I hit an air bubble there. So I have to come out and reset myself, go back in, flash a few times to see where you are, tent up, and then you just go for it and you step down. You're on cut IA. And then you're stepping down and here we see the tip emerging here. And then once you feel like you've done enough at this point, do not pull out from here. You want to go back radially, go back posteriorly, and then come out in the same position that you came in. I think that's really important because I've certainly seen zonules and capsule rip. Now the chamber gets really deep. That was nicely covered in a previous prism eye rounds. Once you do the IZHV, you know, it's just so deep like that. You pull that out, and then I just inject some antibiotic and steroids. Thanks. Beautiful, man. I mean, you, you covered all the great steps there. I, I think there's a couple of comments in the, in the chat group about doing, you know, parse planar approaches. I, I will say that if you have these eyes, I think you really don't have a choice sometimes. You've got to decompress the vitreous. I will say that, you know, we published a series a while ago in nanothalamic eyes, and, and we did find some patients with um, retinal complications and vitreous hemorrhage. And I think, you know, if you look at some of these very small eyes, I mean, 16 millimeter eyes, 17 millimeter eyes, the aura serrata can be, you know, two, 2.5, three millimeters back from the limbus. So it is a challenge in these cases what to do. I, if you have a UBM, it may help us to identify it. Those are really tough situations to kind of decide what to do when you can't form a chamber. Uh, and all the pharmacological treatments are important. So I just add that in there to be mindful. and. Uh, you know, one can also do an anterior approach, right, Chris? I mean, we can go through the anterior chamber. If you're already in the vitreous, why not go up? I agree with you. But, you know, those of you that are a little bit uh, shy of doing that, one can do that and maybe put some some uh, meiotic in the eye to bring the pupil down to avoid a large iridectomy. Um, I know that a lot of people have asked, like, when do you do an IZHV? Um, I don't know if there's any great uh, guidance. I don't know, Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, when would you do an IZHV at the, in the process of doing a lensectomy like this? Yeah, and that's the question of when do you do it, when do you not do it? With this patient, I was like, I think we have to do it because he was an intractable angle closure. Like this was a patient that had resolution of the initial attack and then went back into angle closure. So I felt like you know it was optimal to do the IZBH in this case, um, just to keep the chamber deep. And then once we did it, when I was taking out the viscoelastic, I mean, it was just so deep. And oh, Eileen, how did, how did the patient do? We just saw him. Yeah, so we just saw the patient. He's he has no pain. Vision is still light perception. Pressure is 19. Off, no medications at all. Uh, and he just almost hit a hole in one. He's an avid golfer, you know. <laughs> I got a great. question. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. So in this case, you think what difference if we do just a PPV versus PPV uh, plus IVH, uh, IZH? So what's your opinion about when to just PPV or plus IZH? Yeah, great question. I think I don't know if we have the full answer, but I will say that we've seen people with PPVs and, and no IZHV done and they get malignant, right? And so I think the key for malignant, as Chris mentioned, is really to create the unicameral eye. I don't think we need to do a full vitrectomy. 
um, but just enough to get the uh, vitreous, you know, the uh, vitreous decompressed, AC deepened. So I do like doing an IZHV. And I think Chris is right. When you have somebody with acute angle closure presentation like that, that's the patient that's at risk for malignant glaucoma. Someone with an eye less than 20 millimeters, that's the patient at risk. Someone with a fellow eye that has malignant glaucoma, that's the patient at risk. Or someone with an anterior chamber that's less than 2.2 millimeters, uh, that's why I worry about that patient having that risk. Even if the axial length is more than 20, uh, we've seen these cases. I don't, I don't know if it's just us, but I, I, I've seen too much malignant glaucoma. You know, I mean, after routine FACO, we published it back uh, six, seven years ago, our 20 cases. We've had well over, you know, three, four times that amount now from referrals and from our own. So, you know, and published data, I, I tend to just, if you're less than 20 millimeters, you're getting an IZHV. If you're 2.2 or less AC, you're getting an IZHV. And if you have the other other situations, you're getting an IZHV. It's pretty benign, in my opinion. You don't, you don't even have to do a vitrectomy. You can do it through the anterior chamber if you don't want to do it. And the chamber is formed enough. You don't have to do a vitrectomy even to the PARs. You can go anteriorly if you don't, I'm not comfortable with it. Just on my own thoughts. And I don't, I'm not speaking from firm evidence. It's more semi-evidence plus some anecdotes, of course. Yeah, Ike, and I noticed that in nanophthalmic guys, you know, you, you showed this one video in one of the Prism Grand Rounds where you just did the scleral cut down without the PPV IZH. Did you stop doing it and just do scleral cut downs now for nanophthalmos? So, so I, yeah, no, I always do an IZHV. The question, I guess, is whether I also do a scleral cut down. And, and I think I've just learned maybe the hard way that for these really small eyes, I mean, some of these, I've got a series of like 15, 60 millimeter eyes. I just feel I have to do everything going to me, going for me to resolve their post positive pressure risk. So I basically do an IZHV, but I also do a scleral cut down. I, I, I never do a scleral cut down alone personally, unless it's not an angle closure. For example, I had a patient with uh, with raised episcleral venous pressure, you know, uh, and and I and I did a scleral cut down to you know to ensure we had a had a chance for the um, equilibration of, uh, of superciliary uh, flow and pressure. Then I would do it without an IZ. But otherwise, for angle closure, man, the nanothalmic, I'm always doing IZ speed. It's guaranteed. I, I just question is when to add a scleral cut down. For me, it's less than 18 millimeters. Personal experience. I'll do a cut down then. What are, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? I mean, when do you do scleral cut downs? Yeah, you know, I, I haven't had so many nanothalmic cases, honestly. So it's just like, you know, I, I just, you know, it's, it's more of like, uh, you know, I've been watching your videos and studying that. So when I need to do it, I've never done an 18 millimeter eye, actually at this point, you know, and I, I, I would think I would do a scleral cut down as well, just as prophylaxis, but you know, they're as pretty benign. About, yeah. Pretty benign. Yeah. You know, I mean, do cut down, you're there, stop, you know, and someone did mention a question is if you do too much of a vitrectomy uh, and not infuse the eye, then you could potentially really decompress the eye and that could precipitate a choroidal. So just be mindful uh, of just, you know, having uh, just enough to deepen, but then you're good. Right. I think the goal is not to do a full one in my experience, at least. Yeah, and and the, the the other point is you can always go back and do more, right? So sometimes it's like CPC. If you do too much, like then you can't reverse it, right? So if you do too much vitrectomy, then you can't reverse it. But if you do too little, you can go back and do more if you're hitting positive pressure during the cataract case. So that that's the point of going back in with the trocar. I've been burned in one of those pictures I showed there. I was um, doing it a hot eye angle closure case and I was using a sclerostomy and I sutured it up and closed the conj back up. So I didn't have the option to go back in and then I busted the capsule, right? So in those days, I wish I knew what I know now, right? But that's why, you know, we're learning. Very true. Yeah. Very absolutely true, Chris. We are, we are going back sometimes again in the middle of the case to deepen things up if you need to, because you can get that continual pressure. It's a great, great point. That's great, man. I, I, I think everyone's heart rate is still going pretty strong. So I, I, I'd love, if you guys have some more cases, I'd love to be able to get through them. Um, yeah, I got, I got a, um, a video that I can show that I'm um, interested in get your uh, opinion on, on this one. Um, well, you've, reta you've retained everybody here, man. We've got a good, good size group here and a, and a good size on, uh, on YouTube as well. Still watching, man. Still watching. So, but combined, nice. we've got about a couple hundred people, which is great to see. Oh, yeah. They're here for you. So, no, you know. no, no, that's not true, man. <laughs> you give me too much credit, Chris. Really, you're, you're a gentleman, no, but no. it's not, it's not no, deserved no. to me. It's, uh, it's way more than that. Yeah, I believe the phrase is you to men. So, uh, <laughs> you guys are. You guys are. Yeah, I think we're here for Chris Tang tonight. Okay. Absolutely. So, all right. So, this is, um, Something that, let me share my screen here for a second. Mm -hmm. 
okay, I, I'm interested in get people's opinions on this. So, you know, here I'm doing the Imane. I hit the second um, Imane. I was so psyched. This was a uh, lensectomy combined with retina. They did a lensectomy through a large port there. And then, of course, it's decentered now. So I'm just like, okay, great. You know, I was so stoked, you know, that I finally hit a Yamane that I thought was going to be good and centered. And then what do you do now? You know, it's decentered in both planes, right? It's the nasal temporal plane and the six and 12 plane. I'm sitting temporal here. So do you stretch the IOL to mold? Do you remove one or both haptics, cut and recauterize, remove the IOL and redo? What do we do here? So what do you think? What is? It's a great, yeah. I mean, and th this is something that we, I just had a case today with, uh, with Patrick. Uh, and we had a similar situation where we were kind of judging the position of the of the lens. Jason Jones has done a lot of work here, and he, he recommended stretching the eye well to mold, it looks like. Kathy's saying try three first, which is remove one or both haptics and cut and recauterize. Um, I think those are both things. One pearl I will say is that I, I try to avoid pushing the pushing the uh, the end of the haptic until I'm sure. I kind of try to estimate where it'll be because sometimes I do have to cut the haptic and, um, and, and, and then coag again, just to shorten it up. If I feel that one is, is pulling more than the other. So, um, I use it, use you do pork. Once you put it all the way in, of course, then it's hard to, uh, hard to, uh, to sort of push it out again, although you can, um, you know, that's, that's what I've done in this situation here. Uh, what I have typically done is really kind of, um, you know, identify why this is happening. You know, wh why, why do we have an asymmetrical position? And usually it's because perhaps the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the fixation points were not exactly 180 degrees or the scleral tunnels were not quite the same distance. And it's hard to tell, you know, we, we talk about a two millimeter scleral tunnel with the 30 gauge needle, but you know, like you do, for example, on the vitrectomy, I like to mark the uh, needle two millimeters to know when I'm in already, and then I can enter the, enter the eye, but it's not always easy. And this one here, I don't know. I I'm, I'm kind of torn. I I've, I've done a few things here. I have read, I have certainly removed and redocked as Jason has mentioned. Um, and as he said before, yes, the scleral tunnels may not be equal in length or angulation, angulation so address that. The other simple thing to do would be to, to wrap a suture around it. You know, loop that suture around around that, uh, that uh, in this case, your, your right side haptic and just pull it over, tighten and pull it over. And, and that may do the trick, like a, like a lasso suture we do for subluxed IOLs in the bag. So those would be the two options. That suture idea, suturing is a simple idea. It doesn't require us to redock and potentially the lens is flopping everywhere. So that is an option as well. Those are the two things I'd be thinking about here. Nice. And that was it. So I'm just like, I mean, awesome. Jason Jones is here. I learned so much from Jason Jones's YouTube videos. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm molding it and, you know, it's just not going to mold there. Right. So I'm going to do exactly what Ike said. And this is the key point here. Pro tip for this, Ike, you know, in your videos, you always bend that back end. So you don't hit the cornea coming out, right? So how many times have we done that, right? So that's the key on these proline sutures to bend that back end flat. So when you're pulling it through on the back end, you're not scratching the decimase, right? So I take a 10 0 proline here, CIF needle, docking technique, 27 or 26 gauge needle, just come through. And there's a double ended technique. So dock that, pull that through. Fortunately, this back end doesn't scratch the eye. It's very important how you plan where you're going to be suturing. I mean, some people would have probably gone inferior, right? Just to kind of think they can pull it over, but you're strategically thinking about vectors here. And look at this, right? Of course, you know, this is proline. What happens, right? So, you know, it's just so fine and I just cannot break this knot. So one thing I hate is wasting stitches and wasting things in the OR. I'd like to be efficient. So I'm just like, all right, we'll cut off the other end then we'll just make a scrotomy and just pull through with the micro forceps. Hmm. And this is similar to the McCabe belt stitch from Kathy McCabe. And just a lasso. So I just pull that through. Looking, looking, looking good now. Awesome. Yeah, I, I was just like, man, to, to re-dock and to re-put re it in there, like, I just didn't really feel like doing that. The, the retina case, you know, we were already like three hours into it. And I'm just like, man, that's going to be another real pickle. And I, you know, at that point, you actually, the bulb is already burned. You cut that off and then 
re-pull it back in from the inside and then re re-put a pass and and then dock it? Yeah, I mean, yes, you could do that. In fact, if, it depends how big that bulb is. You can just go in with a micro forceps and just pull that intercamerally, and you basically will kind of essentially pull through that groove. Uh, I've done that. Um, but like I said before, I, I think that using this fixation technique is less involved, and I've done that for sure. I've done that for repositioning eye wheels in the capsular bag where I have two sutures and I'm not still happy with the positioning. So uh, absolutely, be don't be afraid to put another suture in there, and, and you kind of use vectors to get it in position. So great. Great uh, on the fly thinking. I mean that that's that's amazing when you're in the OR and you do this on on the fly. That's the true genius, creative mind uh, at work, which is uh, you can't replicate that, folks. That's just that's just uh, a combination of knowledge, you know, interest, passion, and and um, you know, tactical field work, buddy. That's great. That's amazing. Love it. Creativity. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. It was just like, man, I just don't have the stomach for it, you know? Cause like, you know, when, when you're more of an early Yamane surgeon, let's say, and you're just like getting stoked that you even hit one and then, you know, it's decentered, just like so frustrating. You're like, man, should I buy that kit with the Yamane thing? Or should I, you know, just still continue to freehand? And it's just, that's the challenge of vectors and like trying to hit that perfectly. Right. So, you know, I agree. I mean, I think as Jason said, I mean, it's, it's often the length of that sort of tunnel and the angle that you enter, which is what creates this variability. And so, you know, taking, trying to ensure you have a two millimeter tunnel is important. And so you don't know when you're two millimeters. So just like you did with the retractor probe, you know, you marked it at 10, take a caliper and mark that 30 needle at two, right? So now you know you're, well, you're two in there. And by the time you're at two, you should be now basically in the eye and curve into the eye then to do that. Get that angulation consistent. That means thinking in three dimension. And, uh, you know, even the best of us, after having many, exper many experiences, sometime get situations where we see this and you got to just modify it. Uh, I think that you did the, you did a great job there. But, so congrats, buddy, again. Um, so we what, got so one what, last one. We got oh, one sure, last man. one. I was going to say, please go ahead. I, I, I'm, I think I speak for the group here, man. I'm, we're happy to hear, happy to hear more from you. I know you've been at this for a while. So thank you. It's been amazing. Um, we got one, one more case. Okay. So I think, uh, this will be, uh, hopefully somewhat, uh, interesting. Let me, And great job by the group, by the way. All of you presented extremely well. Very well done. Great work, team. All right, Ike, this is a, a different case, let's say. Just straight up uh, kind of grand rounds presentation. So we saw this patient on September 25th, three days of right eye blurry vision um, with no pain, photophobia, red eye, no flashes or floaters. And he was recently on oral prednisone for a rash on the arms and legs. And then the vision became blurry and he stopped taking it three days ago, the prednisone. And this is his first visit seeing me. He sees a colleague of mine and the last visit with him was in February. And then he had a telehealth visit the day before and was said, you better go in. So he has pigmentary glaucoma. His pressure was in the thirties. He had a trab in the right, a trab in the left and cataract and barbelt in the left eye. I forgot to mention he had PRK in both eyes, sleep uh, apnea on CPAP. He's on dorzolamide timolol, omeprazole, no allergies, no family history, review of system, rash on arms and legs, no travel history. So his vision in the right eye was count fingers, left eye was 2050. He had a little bit of a trace APD, confrontational visual field, severe depression in the right, superior inferior scotoma in the left, IOP 19 and 11. Iris had translumation defects consistent with pigmentary glaucoma. He had three plus pigment with an open angle. His CCT was thin, consistent with PRK. This is his fundus photos, not all the forensics, that's optos, fundus photos. We can see some blunted foveal reflex and elevation in the right possibly. In the left eye, looked pretty unremarkable to me. This is the autofluorescence. You can see just some areas of uh, possible lesions in the right eye. This is visual field, severe depression in the right, consistent with his nerve. And in the left eye, superior arcs. I didn't mention his cup of disc, I put it up there. 0.95 in the right, 0.8 in the left. So this is OCT macula that I got that day. You know, didn't look so bad in the left eye. And in the right eye, there's some uh, retinal pigment epithelial elevations, possibly. 
Here's his OCT macula. It didn't look so bad. There was no CME. So what's the differential here? So, you know, a retinal differential, degenerative, vascular, neoplastic, infectious, CSC, CSCR, autoimmune, right? So what did I think here as the glaucoma guy? Well, maybe it's CSCR. The guy had um, some steroids. It's possible neuroretinitis or some type of chordopathy. And, you know, could have been CSCR given the steroid use. So I referred him to the retina service. And the retina service saw him four days later. This was the fluorescein. So you see early hyper and modeled hypo and hyperfluorescent areas in the right. And they're staining over time, no leakage. So what are some thoughts here about some possibilities? I'll just go ahead. So a detailed review of systems by the retina doctor revealed unprotected sex with three partners in the last three months. So the retina doctor was pretty much on it. Once he um, saw the test, the OCT macula, and he diagnosed him with posterior placoid chorioretinitis, very likely syphilis given the characteristic findings on OCT and the history of rash for one month, much less likely ARN. That was his other differential, SARCOID or TB. And he said, check RPR and some other tests. And sure enough, he had treponema pallidum antibody reactive, RPR reactive, and he was admitted for IV penicillin and got a 14 day course. And October 27th, 2040 and 2030. So it was just wow. amazing that, you know, with penicillin, it could resolve so nicely. And that medication still really works after all these years. So, you know, I had missed that diagnosis, you know, on that first visit. And, you know, this is what I talked about with the retina doctor. And these hyper-reflective nodules are pretty much pathognomonic for um, syphilis. But, you know, for the untrained, like, retinologists like you know us we're not used to seeing like fresh syphilis i hadn't necessarily seen like a fresh syphilis ever maybe in my entire career right where i was the one like first seeing the patient right myself and the fellow and he said this these hyper reflective nodules like you know especially with the rash he was pretty like 99 percent. this is syphilis so wow that that that's an incredible way to cap off these rounds man it's um i, I can't say i've actually seen an active case although i've heard certainly uh, of cases here and there. And uh, I think you described it really well. Um, it's quite fascinating. This in the backdrop of glaucoma, of course, so you never know what comes up. And I always try to tell the team, you know, uh, di the glaucoma diagnosis is the last thing you're diagnosing. We're diagnosing everything else first, and then we're diagnosing glaucoma or cataract or whatever else we're, we're, uh, we're looking at. So um, great pearls. And, and you've got, uh, you've got a lot of great comments here. They're asking, a lot of people are asking you, Dr. Tang, did you shake hands with the patients, but I guess with COVID you didn't have to. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, no handshaking. Exactly. But, you know, I, you know, I was just like, you know, in retrospect, you know, cause I saw that patient with uh, the fellow and the resident, I'm like, should we have hit this diagnosis? Right. Well, if we were in tune with it, right. If we looked closely at some of those segments and asked about sexual history, like for sure we could have sent them for those tests had we known. Right. But this is like, you know, something out of left field for us. I was thinking, you know, this guy has progressive glaucoma, maybe, or CSC, you know, given the steroid history, right? So, you know, even with the rash, we didn't take that next step to ask him about the sexual history. So, you know, had we taken that next step, then I think we could have, you know, hit that diagnosis, you know, but, you know, he still got quick turnaround four days later, got diagnosed and, you know, had really good resolution. Well, it's good to refer when you, in those situations as well. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. Just taking a complete history. We'd often don't take time to do that. Uh, you know, look at the patients, uh, you know, just look at their hands, look at their nails. Sometimes you pick up something on your fingers, look at their, you know, the rest of their, their ad, anatomy and take a good reasonable history. Uh, I have to admit, I've been, I've been sometimes lackadaisical. It seems so obvious that it's a glaucoma problem, high pressure, go whatever, and you miss something that's important. So, uh, so great reminder that uh, we're, we're MDs, right? We're MDs. We're not just uh, looking at the eye only and things cross over uh, all the time in our clinic. And, and these are the rare cases that I think distinguish, uh, you know, distinguish us from, from, from one another to, uh, to kind of dig a bit deeper. But uh, that, that was a great share. Thank you for the reminder. And I think as, as we've heard from the group as well, I mean, we are seeing a rising, uh, rising cases of syphilis, unfortunately. So uh, again, my colleagues in Montreal just said she saw an active case with, 
papillitis and syphilis can present in so many different ways. I, I, you know, we used to often see it being ordered as part of standard uveitis workups and patients would get upset. You know, why are you accusing me of, of, uh, of having syphilis in order this test? The lab said you're getting the, what's this test for is for syphilis. Well, you know, again, important to probably have that discussion with, with, with patients as to why, or why we're ordering what we're ordering. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uveitis experts with us and, and we, we sometimes get a bit lazy because of that, I guess. But uh, again, no excuse to try to not look for that. So um, I want to just thank you. Uh, thank you really from the bottom of my heart for such a great round. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, you know, Chris, you, you clearly, uh, you know, and your team clearly embody your spirit of, uh, of just cutting edge learning and passion. Um, you know, each of you presented so well. I, pre I appreciate all the effort you've made. I know that was not a small feat to do, the preparation here. Um, you know, all of you, all of you, G, Ian, Soshin, uh, Eileen, thank you for presenting. Uh, Ricky, thanks for helping uh, and, and, and Matt helping to put this together, get this group together. You know, Chris, dude, what can I say, man? I mean, you're, you're, you're a true brother. You're a, two, you're a true, uh, you know, colleague in this, in this battle we're, we're facing and trying to, you know, bring cures and treatments for our patients with tough, complex problems. I think Yale is very lucky to have someone like you there to help teach, but also to help provide great patient care, man. And I, it just, it just warms my heart, man. I, I, I feel like uh, we have some good times and I feel like, um, you know, this, this is the time I want to, I want to, I'm going to message you later, man. We're going to do some stuff together and collaborate. And, you know, I mean, that, that's really what the beauty of medicine is, right. Is the collaborations and the, and the ability to work with people together and learn. Um, I, I'm just in awe really of the effort you've made. It's just first class and right from the introduction, man, that, that was uh, a bit teary eyed, I must say, and, uh, and, and quite uh, memorable. So thank you for doing that. I, I really can't thank you enough. And I hope uh, when we see each other, we'll be able to catch up and have a nice, uh, you know, chat and, and uh, eat and drink and, and give each other a hug when we get this COVID past past here, man. That's uh, that's for sure. Um, Matt, I, I want to thank you for uh, getting this together, buddy. We'll keep keep these rounds going. Uh, really great interaction. This was a highly interactive uh, group of um, attendees, and we had a really good turnout, which is great to see from around the world, man. You guys got you guys got Yale around the world talking here, and I am sure you will you will have people change their practice. Not every not every rounds we see people actually, I think, considering to change what they do a little bit. I think you've done that, uh, at least made people think about it. So exactly, this is an epic collaboration. Um, it's fantastic. So uh, group hug, as, uh, as, as, we've, as we've seen here, Andrew, as Andrew says, uh, and you've got a lot of great uh, comments coming to you, Chris. So, so thank you very much again, brother. I really appreciate it. Really kind to take the effort to do this. Let's get a screenshot, huh? We need Let's a do screenshot. that. Let's get a great screenshot. Hang on, we gotta do this. And okay, yeah, we need a screenshot. Let's right, smile, guys. Hold on, hold on. Let me let me make sure I get this right here. Okay, all right. Everyone smile. Got to got to got to remember these. And these these rounds will be posted. So we we often get a, you know a large group of people watching these later on. We our friends in Europe uh, and around the world don't often get to stay up this late. So um so we'll be we'll be posting this as it's always posted online as well. If you want to watch the rest of it or you miss some of it. So thank you again, Chris. And any last words from you, brother? Thanks so much for. Uh, for being here and spending, you know, a few hours with us, man. Very kind of you to be here tonight. Well, I just want to say thank, uh, thank you so much, Ike. It's just, uh, you know, such an honor for us to be here. You know, you certainly taught me so much, and you know, I am your fellow, your YouTube fellow, like I mentioned. And you know, I've learned so much from you over the years, and respect you and admire you so much. So thank you so much. It's back at you, my friend. I learned from you, and I learned from you again here tonight. So uh, it's it's totally mutual, man. This. Uh, this learning and admiration. So thank you so much. Uh, keep it going. Uh, we'll be we'll be keeping in touch with everybody here and uh, communicating. We're hoping we'll be together sometime next year, right? That's what we're looking at. So stay yeah. safe until then, and you know, be be real and and take the right precautions and and uh, keep on smiling, man. We'll get through all this, and it's a great noble cause helping people. And and uh, again, I wish all of you, Ian, Eileen, G, uh, Soshin. I mean, in your in your early careers. Um, you know, it's, it's a great place to be. You've got a great mentor and uh, I'm sure we'll be collaborating together again. So thank you very much. Thank you all. And peace oh, to Mike, Mike, I wanted to show you, Mike, I yeah. wanted to show you one more thing. I forgot. I've been holding out. Yeah. Dude, I was going to ask you. About <laughs> <laughs> Dang, man. That, that, though, I was wondering why you're looking, why you're looking so happy. That's why you did that. <laughs> you know what? That they is say. awesome, man. That is awesome. Like you gotta, Ike, be like Ike, but it ain't working. So I think you wear it better, man. As you can see, I'm 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 really uh, 
really this is the longest I've ever had it, man. But it looks good on you, my friend. It looks good on you. <laughs> Keep going. You were you. I was trying not to move. So <laughs> I, I, I like... thought you had to sleep back there. That's that's a that's a good look, man. I that's. That is well done, man. You're pulling all these surprises. I keep it going, my friend. <laughs> You've Co- got to so on, much with you now, you know? <laughs> exactly. That's, that's a good one, man. I like that. Good luck, buddy. Saving the best for last. Exactly, as Michael said. <laughs> okay, listen, have a great night. Have a great uh, rest. And uh, we'll be back at again in a couple of weeks. Uh, send us your ideas for other topics. Um, Matt, you've been great putting these together. So we'll uh, we'll be looking forward to next. It's hard to top this one, man. This was uh, was really phenomenal, really phenomenal, fantastic. Peace, everybody. Love. Take care. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks.